If you will, turn back in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 9. The book of Genesis chapter 9, and you can follow me also in your pastor's commentary. If I might, what I'm trying to do as we are now in the Advent season is take a long look in history from the time of the uh, post-flood event, which I don't hope to expand on too much here, all the way to Calvary. I want you to think with me two weeks from now, on December 23rd, when we are worshiping the newborn king, and that what happened at that time in terms of his birth and his life and his death have everything to do with the text in front of us. So I want you to think in terms of a big picture. Now you can think about me as King David right now, just for a moment, all right? And, and I've got a bow, a, a slingshot in my hand, okay? I want you to catch this. Now my objective is to smash the head of the Philistine. And you'll be able to identify that as we work through the text today. But this is a long trajectory. It's at least 2,500 years before Christ. Minimum. But see, with God, a day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years like a day. So for God, distance is nothing. And in fact, with prophecy, you've got to know that. We do believe that the Lord is coming, do we not? Right? But God's people have been tried by the trap of chronology around the coming of Christ ever since they heard that he was coming. Peter made mention of the very days we are in now in Genesis 9 when Peter said, where's the promise of his coming? Well, I'll tell you where the promise of his coming is. The promise of his coming is in the word of God. And every time we properly comprehend the word of God, God's promises are made manifest to us. And because we are right now still, I think, blessed with the aroma of covering, permeating our thoughts. I don't know about you, but I enjoyed the Adam series. I enjoyed God revealing himself to us as a God that covers. And I told you that when there are major principles established in the prophetic word, they become patterns that run all the way through the Bible. Have I told you that? Have I taught you that? That you look for patterns because that's how God works. He doesn't change in his principle. He may change in his mode, but he doesn't change in his principle. And one of the things you want to know about the God of the Bible is that he's a God that what? Covers. He's a God that covers. And because he's a God that covers, you and I are comforted, are we not? And have we not learned that that covering is a person? And what is his name? We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, those who believe in God by faith. God hath clothed us sufficiency with the totality of all that Christ is so that we live by faith and we walk in the grace of God. Do we not? Right. So the gospel is to teach you and I the character of God and the ways of God. And they should take on that same reflection in our life. I think we heard it this morning in 1 John chapter 3. Yes, beloved, he that doeth righteousness is of God. And he that doeth not righteousness is not of God. Is that what the text says? So I want you to determine today by the narrative that we're going to be dealing with. And we're going to be in a small window of Genesis chapter 9 where we're dealing with the infamous event of the drunkenness of Noah and the scandal of his son Ham and the curse that came upon his grandson Canaan. And what does all that have to do with righteousness? Now, if you've been taught properly, you should discover the act of righteousness in our narrative particularly if you've been walking with me for the last three weeks in the Genesis 3 narrative. Are y'all tracking with me so far? You should see the paradigm. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. I'm here again in this text teaching you how I work in a world full of sin. And so as we talk about 
uh, the concept of God covering here in Genesis 9, the title of our message is really, They Covered Him. They Covered Him. I really have moved on from Adam uh, in terms of the principle. It shouldn't be there, but that's okay. I want you to capture this thought. They what? Covered Him. Subject, verb, object. They covered Him. Glorious. Why do I say that? Because we had a time where, watch this, a husband covered his wife. And in that same narrative, we discovered that a father covered his son. And now we're looking at sons covering their father. He that doeth righteousness is of God. God teach me how to be a coverer. How to cover, how to cover, because that is after your nature. Now, I do have a lot of things to say preliminary to our main point, and, and I'll try to make it as quick as possible. As I stated, I, I am still enjoying the commentary and expressions from our brethren around the whole concept of Adam uh, doing what he did, and Eve and Adam uh, being recovered by the mercy and grace of God in a covering paradigm. And so this is what I want to press home from the fall of Adam and Eve to where we are in Genesis chapter 9, you and I do know that sin entered into the world, did it not? Point number one, let's keep it moving. Point number one, death reigned from Adam to who? To Moses. And where we are in our narrative is in between Adam and Moses. And we have seen a lot of death from Genesis 4 forward, have we not? Genesis chapter 4 lays out for us, the Cain and Abel event, where Cain kills his brother Abel. That becomes the first physical mortal death in the world. And here's what I would say about that for you to actually begin to track with me around the gospel. The first attack was in Genesis 3-1 when the devil attacked God through Eve. The second attack by the serpent is in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, when he works through Cain to kill Abel. That's the second attack. The third attack, whether you know it or not, is in Genesis 6, verses 1 through 3, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men and married them, took them and married them. That's attack number three. Because you guys do know we are in a warfare since the fall, are we not? And, and if we're going to track with God in the proto-evangel of, Gen of Genesis 3, verse 15, your seed shall bruise his heel and her seed will crush his head. You and I want to see that in the Bible, don't we? We see the warfare and attack with the two first boys. We see it again in Genesis 6, uh, verse 2 and 3 under my second sub-point. Abandonment of the gospel in the society. This is what we were learning this morning in Sunday school. When a society goes apostate, when the church departs from the word of God, the whole society becomes like a piece of rotten meat. Because what the church is in the world is two things, salt and light. When you and I are salt, we influence the world. And when we're light, we inform the world. And God's called you and I to be both salt and light. Now, salt influences while disappearing. For you never see the salt when it enters into the meat or enters into the food or enters into the product. So the believer in the world looks like everybody else. So we don't have an outward form by which people can look on us and say, oh, there's a believer. Because believers are men and women who are objects of grace and we walk by what? But we live in the world, though we're not of the world. And it's not our goal to influence the world for Christ. And our job is to die to self, stripped of every kind of fig leaf we might have. Because so long as we're saying, look how different I am, we're pointing to ourselves and not the Savior. Am I making sense? You are the salt of the earth. That means your job is to be influential as you remain appearing like everybody else in the world. 
You don't want your righteousness to be that you have some kind of outward form different than anybody else. Do you notice that you never read in the Bible what Jesus looked like? Do you know why? Because the incarnate Son of God, who is the revelation of the invisible God, and the express image of his person is not to be comprehended by how tall he was, short he was, dark he was, long hair or not. All of that is completely irrelevant to the attributes and characteristics of God. God never allowed us to actually see or have a view of the physicality of Christ. And all images of Christ are abominations. Everyone. For they do not fairly and accurately describe who that particular human being was in his time. You have in the white culture a white Jesus. You have in the black culture a black Jesus. You got in the Mexican culture a Mexican Jesus. And then you got in the Asian culture an Asian Jesus. All wrong. All wrong. Paul learned early on in 2 Corinthians 5.15, we know no man after the flesh. Even Jesus we don't know after the flesh. We don't get caught up in ethnicity. We don't get caught up in skin, skin color. We certainly don't buy into the fictitious category called race. The Bible is very clear. It's only one race, the human race. And what we all have in common is we're rebels. So some idols are going to get tore down today. Okay, is that all right? Because you can never see the glory, glory of God clearly as long as you are clothed in the fig leaves of racism and discrimination. You guys see that? You can never see his glory clearly so long as you're wrapped up in your blackness. Because the very reason for which... Jesus was crucified was because the Jews thought they were something being Jews. Are y'all hearing me? I didn't mean to take this long route, but this will work when we get to our third point. Under point number one, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Romans 5.12 says, for by one man's sin, what? Entered into the world and death by sin for all have sinned. And in our text, we have the enmity against the gospel in the family. That's Genesis 4.8. This is where Cain kills his own brother. And you know that one of the primary mandates that God gave the married couple was to do what? Proliferate, have children. And so we, we recognize in our world there are two cultures, a culture of life and a culture of death. And the role of the devil is to kill humanity because every person born bears the image of God. So this is why we say he's coming to do what? Kill, steal, kill, and what? Destroy. And we see it in Cain, do we not? And if God wasn't gracious enough in his maintaining his purpose of proliferation, he'd have to wipe Cain out because of the wages of sin is what? But God had mercy on Cain, didn't he? Gave him a mark, sent him down the road, let him proliferate. But that was only to establish the battle that you and I must acknowledge that's in the world. Because in our last message, we laid it out clear, right? Two seeds, the seed of the righteous and the seed of the wicked. By the time we get to Genesis 6, pull it up, Genesis 6, 1, 2, and 3, we got the seed battling again. And here are the paradigms. I want you to get them. Here are the paradigms. As Eve was tempted by the serpent to look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, remember, she saw, she took, and she what? She saw, she took, she ate. When we get to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, what we discover is that the sons of God, here it is, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. You see the construction? They're looking at the daughters of men the same way Eve looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Pastor, what's wrong with that? They learned earlier on. That godly men and women are not to be unequally yoked with ungodly people. So in the same way that Eve is, as it were, breaking boundary and crossing over, so the sons of God are doing the same thing. Are they not? The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, beautiful. That's the same word for the tree of life, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil being good. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Watch. Saw 
beautiful chose. Is that what Eve did? And notice what it says. You can go to verse 3 now. And notice what it says. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also what? And yet his days shall be 120 years. And in this particular narrative, what you discover is that God said, All right, that's enough. I'm getting ready to wipe out the whole world. That is a very, very tense and very ominous text to work through because what we know about God is that God is a God of what? Patience. Is he patient? So if God wipes the world out, he's already executed a lengthy amount of patience with mankind. That's why when God comes on the last day and he turns this world into fire and starts all over again, guess what we will have known? God has exhausted his long suffering with mankind. In the Genesis narrative here, what we discover is that God destroyed the world, did he not? He destroyed the world, speaking to Noah. Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord and God telling Noah to build an ark. And the only person saved in that ark paradigm of the preaching of the gospel was Noah's family. And then we come to the text that we're dealing with now in Genesis chapter 9. Going back to our first point, just to clear it up. Subpoint C, God's long suffering terminated in Genesis 6, 9 through 13. All, all flesh. God had said that the imagination of the hearts of men were only continual, continually evil and that they had corrupted their way on the earth and that violence had filled the earth. And God said, that's enough. Destroyed the whole world with the exception of eight souls. And under subpoint C, God's long suffering is what? We open up in chapter 9, however, with God reestablishing the covenant. Look what it says in chapter 9, verse 1. This is what you need to know about God. When he in interrupts his plan and his purpose of redemption by executing a judgment, it's not that the judgment should be left to be viewed as God's final act. God always continues his plan of mercy. So we see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, What? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. 9-1 gives us once again the very clear signet that God plans on making sure the world is full of people. Are you hearing me? Even though he has just wiped out all of humanity. Do you know what he just did? He reestablished Noah's family as the second first family. They are the second first. Now they are the first family. Do you know what that means? They've got a target on their back. The devil is about to come after them as well. Because whenever you are part of God's family and God's real family is the first family, you are under attack. So the Genesis narrative in chapter 9 opens up with God reestablishing the mandate for a proliferation. And we see within that early part of chapter 9 how that God was very pleased with the sacrifice that Noah offered up. And he says, I will never destroy the, uh, the world again with a flood. You guys remember that? And he says over in verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh and the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth and God said unto Noah this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth now the covenant people of God in the days of Moses are the first to read this are they not the covenant people of God in the days of Moses as they are making their way through the wilderness into the promised land are the ones receiving Torah. Raise your hand if you got that. I got to teach today. So you and I are the second category people who are learning. And I told you that the people of God in the days of Moses would have picked up on the symbology and typology much quicker than you and I. They would have clearly gotten what's in our text relative to what they were dealing with. Because now that they're dealing with the second Adam paradigm, our family group in Noah, they realize that Moses is talking to them about their own behavior in Noah and his sons. And that what God had commissioned Israel to do is part of the prophecy that's about to come forth in the mouth of Noah. Are you guys hearing me? 
And so you and I want to put our feet in the shoes of the nation of Israel and be tutored by God through Moses concerning Christ in our text and ask this question. Do I understand the value of covering? Or am I part of that wicked group of people who loves exposing? Because the dichotomy here is between exposing and covering. Exposing and covering. Exposing and covering. Are you guys with me? Exposing, discovering, shaming, blaming, telling, gossiping, exposing or covering. Exposing or covering. We're about to go deep. Y'all ready to go deep? That's what the text is teaching us about, and we want to comprehend it. So I move quickly now to point number two, the fatigue of a what kind of father? And I say that with all of the earnestness in my soul, ladies and gentlemen. It is clear in the Bible that God saves men and women, and he saves them for one reason. They are sinners. They are sinners. And God must save sinners if he's going to have anybody in this fellowship with him. Because there's none what? There's none that doeth what? There's none that seeketh after God. No, not one. So stay with me now. I don't want you to stumble when we think about what just happened to Noah. Noah has just gone through the most traumatic event that the world could have known in his day. The destruction of the whole human race. Now you can call him whatever you want to, but I'm calling that man valiant. Because for 120 years, he put up with a rebel world who never turned to Christ. Never once turned to Christ. Not one person, not one child, not one woman, not one man, not one teenager. 120 years of ministry. And the only person coming to church is his family. Do you realize how much of a test that is on the soul when you are evangelizing the world? For the Bible clearly tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You know what he did all day long? Preach Christ and paint the picture of Christ in a boat that was two football fields long. Everybody in the world knew he was a gospel preacher. Everybody knew he, in the world knew that he was shut up to one thing. Christ is the way out. Everybody in the world knew that Noah knew that salvation was by grace through faith in Christ alone apart from works. Everybody knew that fool, like Paul was a fool, preached Jesus, Jesus, Jesus every day. And still they wouldn't come. Still they wouldn't come. They said, now you're preaching this Jesus as the art of salvation. Concerning a rainy day we have never ever had once in our life. See the test? Do you see the test? They're making an argument on empiricism under the assumption of what we call uh, continuity of, uh, of the creative order, that things continue the same because things were that way yesterday. But the Bible's very clear. The order of uniformity in terms of chronology does not work that way. You might have 10 years of things going the same, and then God breaks in with a judgment. Does he not? It just happened with us in California with the fire. Here we are enjoying now clean air, are we not? I'm so thankful for it. I open my windows in the morning and say, thank you. But it doesn't have to last. God doesn't know us a thing. And he can break in on judgments with his inscrutable judgment anytime he wants to. Is that right? And we as believers know that. And God has done that throughout history many, many times. Has he not? Many times God has broken in on presumptuous hum human beings, letting them know, you don't know what tomorrow may bring. You don't know if the sun's going to rise tomorrow. You don't know if I'm going to let you breathe tomorrow. You better say, if the Lord will, I'll do this, I'll do that. Because God can break in any time. Noah went through 120 years of dealing with rebels, gainsayers, 
people, if, if you will, opposing him and mocking him because that's what happens when you faithfully preach the gospel. Many are called. Few are chosen. In Noah's day, none came. I give him credit for being a faithful preacher of the gospel. In my generation, a man doesn't see two or three conversions in a month. He sells the gospel out for prosperity. He sells the gospel out for emotionalism. He sells the gospel out for psychology. He sells the gospel out for pragmatism. He sells it out for numbers. For numbers. When God says, you shall not follow a multitude to do evil. God can save by few or by many. The most important thing that we are to be is faithful to God's word. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? 120 years. 120 years. That brother just nailing those boards. Boom. Boom. Every nail is a gospel doctrine. Boom. Boom. Every plank is an affirmation that the Bible is all about Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. Boom. Boom. Every day preaching Christ. And then one day God says, all right, no, that's enough. Let's go. And people are walking around, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, buying and selling and marrying and getting married and, and doing all kind of crazy sinful stuff I'm going to talk about now. And then they look up and there was a raindrop hitting them on their forehead. They go, what is that? I don't want to be too long, but there was never any rain on the earth. There was a canopy covering the earth where that the weather temperature was equal and equidistant all around the world, almost kind of like a greenhouse effect. Until God ruptured the world in the fall. So men and women were living in some wonderful California weather. Until that drop of rain hit them on their forehead and said, well, what, what is that? That's Noah speaking through the rain. And if you know your Bible well, God called Noah and his family in and God shut the door. And on that very same day, the waters came down in torrents. Did it not? Point number one under uh, sub point two, the fatigue of a faithful father, Noah, Job, and Daniel. I just want to affirm this. When you see the term Noah, Job, and Daniel, it means that God had viewed these men as the choicest men of the earth. Not that they were better than anyone else, but they were marked out as great types of Christ. Noah, Daniel, and what? Job. Great types of Christ in that they all went through serious tribulation at times when marked changes would occur in the world. One verse, Ezekiel 14.4. Notice what God says in Ezekiel 14.4 as he's admonishing Israel for its false sense of security under a idea of them being righteous. Here's what he says. Therefore speak unto them, son of man, and say unto uh, them, thus saith the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that set it up his idol in his heart, and put it the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Do you see that? Do you notice what he just said? He says, men and women sit up all night long, plan and scheme and enterprise goals and objectives that have nothing to do with God's glory. All have to do with their own lust and passion. All have to do with fulfilling their own lust. And then they go to church the next morning to get God to bless it. I know that's not you. I just know that's not you. Notice what God says. I will answer them myself. Look at what it says in verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 5. That I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all what? Estranged from me through idols. Verse 14. Pull it up to verse 14 because what God does is use Ezekiel as a model and example of this. I'm sorry, verse, uh, there it is. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were what? In it. That is, in among the people who are doing all this. Though they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. God said, I'm still going to judge Israel. In other words, they won't escape. Even though Noah was there. Even though Job was there. Even though Daniel was there. Now, this is advised because remember in the days of Abraham, let's go back to our text. Remember in the days of Abraham when God interrupted the world again among who? The uh, Sodomites, Sodom and Egypt, Sodom and Gomorrah. And God prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and God, uh, Noah, God, God, Noah, I'm not Noah, Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah and said, God, if there be 50 righteous, 
if there be 40 righteous, if there be 30 righteous, if there be 10 righteous, there wasn't even 10 righteous. And the wrath of God came down, didn't it? What God told Israel was, if Noah and Job and Daniel were there, still the wrath of God will come down. That's when God's justice and mercy now cannot be mitigated by any kind of plea. So we know that God brings judgment. And this is where this is where my friend uh, Noah becomes someone for which I have a bit of, of empathy. And I moved to point number B to say this. When we look at our text, it's very true that what happened to Noah in verse 20 and 21. Let's look at that. And Noah in uh, verse 20 and 21 is what I am calling a, a moment of stumbling in his liberty, a moment of stumbling in his liberty. I'm not going to develop this. One will quickly take this text of scripture and begin to build uh, an octagon to fight the pro and cons of alcohol. Are y'all hearing me? One will quickly take a text like this and go to argue. See, that's why you should never drink. And now all of a sudden we're going to war over whether you can drink or not, whether you can get drunk or not, whether, you know, this is a good thing, whether it's a bad thing. That's not really what the text is about. But may I say this, if you read your Bible carefully, you will never, ever find in the Bible that the people of God cannot drink. You will never find it. What you will always find is drunkenness is totally forbidden. That's what you will find. Now, the problem with that interpretation is not God's, as it were, leaving so much room for us to have to labor to interpret it. The problem with you and I is our sinfulness. Because there are many liberties that God gives us that we turn into idols. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Many liberties that we turn into idols. So I'm not going to sit here and defend by going through all the scripture where wine is everywhere. Wine has been in the Bible since Adam and Eve. The next major event you find in your Bible is in Genesis chapter 12 and 13 where guess who shows up? Brother Melchizedek. And guess what he's bringing to the table? Wine and bread. And he's the greatest high priest in the world. So God is not forbidding alcohol beverage on the part of the people of God. They have always been part of the larger worship celebratory mode in national Israel. Always has been a part of it. And it points to the blood and righteousness of Christ by which our sins are forgiven and joy is put in the heart. Is that right? And so we don't want to go there. What we want to know is that when Noah began to be a husbandman a second time because all of God's servants are called husbandmen, he planted a vineyard, verse 21. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was what? That was his mistake. That was his mistake. And he was what? Uncovered in his tent. Pause. Paradigm of gospel lesson to be taken right here. Learning the gospel is right here. This statement right here demands that you sit down and ask God, what are you saying redemptively? Because the redemptive reality of God's purpose of grace is about to come out in God's choices servant. What he said here was that Noah allowed himself to drink too much. And now Noah knows that he is unstable, incapable of functioning now. He is in his what? Tent. Now let me establish that a little bit more. I thank God about the tent that he was in because when you take the concept of a tent and run it all the way through the Bible, tents become places, watch this now, where God shows his sacred mercy but they also become places where man shows his sinful actions. The tent represents the place where you have your privacy. It's the place where you have your secrecy. It's the place of boundary between you and everyone else except maybe your spouse. Are y'all with me? Can I lay the foundation? And so when God says he was drunk in his tent, you know what I realized? He was a man that was discreet even in his drunkenness. 
because he was not out in the street, not out and about, not out in the society causing a scandal to the name of God to his children. He was in his private quarters. Are y'all hearing? And this is important because when you find yourself um, distracted from righteousness, let's call drunkenness a moment of distraction from righteousness. Raise your hand if y'all got that. Because this is going to help some of you keep from putting on fig leaves and get the gospel right. There are times when you and I are distracted from righteousness. We are caught up in some carnality and can be very much overtaken in it. And according to the Bible, that's drunkenness. When you are not sober spiritually and sober practically because you are inebriated by some worldly carnal thing, you are spiritually drunk. For the true believer, that's a moment of distraction. And it happens to all of us. And what Noah does is make sure he stays in his tent so that he does not act irresponsible publicly before his boys. Now, when you get in trouble, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to retreat and go to your private place where God can deal with you. Are you hearing me? You don't go out and scandal yourself. A fool discovereth all his, all he wants to do is have people see him and his folly. That's what your Facebook is about. That's what the internet is about. That's what all the social media is about. Opening up the tent and letting the world see your nakedness. That's where we are. Can I keep teaching? So I'm laying a foundation to help you understand that the trajectory of God's response to Noah will not be even hinted at as being the fact that he was drunk. God's response to this text will not be because Noah was drunk. God will be working through Noah to show us something more hideous than that. It's what his son did when Noah was in his tent, in his private quarter, waiting to recover. When his son, Ham, came looking for daddy. This is where the whole narrative of the structure of government, of the apostasy of the church, of the corruption of the world is about to emerge out of this event. Are you guys with me? Out of this event. This is where this is going to emerge. Go back to your point. Then let's look at this quickly under point number two, the fatigue of a faithful father. I use that statement because here's what I know. Here's what I know. I've been teaching us this year that we want to be the kind of people that as we run this gospel race, I want to finish how? I want to finish well. But I am so clear that the Bible shows us that just when we are on that last leg of the race, we let our guards down and the adversary can nip us in the heel and cause us to stumble. That's what's happening to the last millennial in the world. What do you mean millennial, pastor? When you understand the Genesis ta uh, table of genealogies in Adam, chapter 5, you discover in, Adam, uh, in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam lived to be a 900 and how many years old? 30 years old, 930. And after Adam, he had a son named Jared. Jared lived to be something like 965 years old. And then he had Methuselah. Methuselah lived to be 960-something years old as well. Listen, that's almost a millennium. You guys got that? Man, that's a long time living, isn't it? But why did God let them live that long? Proliferation. Proliferation. So that they can have a bunch of children. Are y'all following me? Proliferation. Proliferation. But remember, we got a warfare going on, right? The godly seed and the ungodly seed. Y'all with me? So as proliferation is taking place under Adam and Eve, as proliferation are taking place under the children of Adam and Eve, which would have been the daughters of Adam and Eve that Cain would have married. Y'all follow that logic? So that's real simple. This is one of those Sunday school classes. Who did Cain marry? He married his sister. He married his sister, sister, sister. Because when you live to be a thousand years old, you can have a lot of wives. And you'll know that God allowed polygamy at that time for proliferation. It couldn't have been done any other way. Are y'all hearing me now? Am I answering some questions? 
almost a thousand years, a, 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 a millennial. That's what we mean by a thousand years, a millennial. Now, here's what happened. The devil attacked Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, 1. Attack, attack 1. The devil attacks Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, 8. That's attack 2. The devil attacks the sons of God in the days of Noah when the ark was in building, Genesis uh, 6. That's attack number what? 3. God destroys the world. Here, uh, uh, here Noah and his sons, three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, are now... The only people on the earth. What is God calling them to do? We learned that in verse 1 of chapter 9. Proliferate. I've been teaching this for years. Have a bunch of sex. It was good back in that day. We got problems today, okay? But back in that day, having babies is what God wanted. But having babies becomes the matrix of the warfare, too. So what God knows is that some of the sons of the sons of God are going to be antichrist. God knew that some of the sons and daughters of even the faithful servants of God would be wicked men and women. This is what happened with Cain and Abel. But God says, still have them. Are you with me? And so what God does is allows Noah to begin the process of proliferating the world. His sons are largely the ones doing it. In this context, Noah is out of the ark. It took a whole year after the flood. We can lay that out. A whole year after the flood for the process of the flood to dry up and, and Noah and his family leave the ark. We don't know how long it was between them coming out of the ark and this particular event of stumbling. For we know that Noah was 600 years old when he went in. The end of our narrative tells us that Noah was 950 years old when he died. That's another 300 years plus after the flood. That's a long time to live. So for the people of God in the days of Moses, they would have comprehended the chronology because chronology was everything to them. And so in our account, we have what I call the fatigue of a faithful father because he stumbles in his liberty. Ephesians 5, 18 says, be not drunk with wine, but be full of the Holy Ghost. Now, may I assert this as I move on into the more pressing elements of our text? Noah was full of the Holy Ghost. Full of the Holy Ghost. But on this day. On, on this day, he was full of wine, too. All right, so I, 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 I'm one of these people that thinks deeply, and I work through implications, and I look at all of the peripheral data. That's just me. I'm considering time. I'm considering the fact that ain't nobody else on the planet but Noah and his three boys. I'm considering that they all have so much real estate in front of them to work with that the job and task in front of them is absolutely phenomenal. I'm considering that that year of tomo and judgment really weighed on them because one day you see the world populated. The next day, nobody in the world. And the whole shape of the world has changed through the flood. We are in a new world. Now, the man that's in the new world is Noah, but he's the same brother that was in the old world. Now, this is a type of salvation. Because we have a B.C. before Christ, and we've got an A.C. after Christ. Do we not? And we got stuff we remember from over there while we're living over here. Is that right? And sometimes the stuff that's over there troubles us over here. Can I get a witness? Sometimes the stuff that's from over there can trouble us over here. Now you can waste five or ten minutes of your own time thinking through what the world looked like in the days when the sons of God married the daughters of men and giants were in the earth. And we're not talking about these crazy 12 foot, 15 foot people that you get on the internet. That's ridiculous. We're not talking about demons having sex with human beings. That's absurd. Will you guys hear me? That's utterly absurd. That's paganism. We've taught that for years. That's not biblical. It's not possible. Every seed bearing herb brings forth fruit of its own kind. And you can't take angels and have sex with humans and create hybrid humans. That's totally paganism. But what you can have in a world where the church goes crazy and abandons biblical truth and abandons morals and ethics 
is a world in Noah's day before the flood that looks like the day you and I live in now, where men and women are doing that which is right in their own eye. Every way of man is corrupt and perverse and wicked, and the earth is filled with violence. The way it was in the days of Noah before the flood is the way it is in my generation now. Exactly like where I'm at now. Noah lived in my generation. My generation is a generation of people who don't know God and therefore don't know themselves. And they don't know temperance and godliness and virtue. They don't know boundaries and respect. They don't know order and hierarchy. They don't know structure. Every man is operating out of a Babylonian chaos. Are you guys with me? This is what was going on in Noah's day. So help me now, when you're saved by grace, you are simultaneously what? Righteous and what? We bring some of that stuff on the other side, don't we? Do we? And so Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth have to deal with the paradigm of a new world, but the struggle of an old battle. Brother Noah made a mistake. But his mistake was marked, as I said to you, by boundaries that I acknowledge in the scriptures. He was in his tent. Leave him alone. He would have woke up and said, God, I got it. This wine that I made, whoo, this stuff is just tough. I got to water this, this thing down. Because I can enjoy it, but I, I can't get lost because I have a, a mission. This was true for all the priests. This was true for all the prophets. This is true for all the servants of God. And this is why my master, who is the most sober man in the world, his first miracle was turning water into wine because he never wants us to not live in the joy of the Holy Ghost and the joy of the gospel and the joy of good things in this world. That is not grace. Did y'all hear what I just said? It is not grace. But when you are an object of grace, you have the power of the gospel to give you a temperate life where you love sobriety. I love thinking right, don't you? I love being clear-headed. In my unsafe state, I was often unclear because I was often inebriated. Anybody remember Cheech and Chong? Them was my cousins. Them was my cousins. Them was my cousins. And so, you know, I, I would be reeking everywhere I go and I could still perform. I could still handle my business still play ball, still get good grades, graduated early with a big old bud in my mouth. Anybody bear record with what I'm talking about? But just because you are a functional alcoholic or a functional marijuana smoker does not mean you are not impacting your life for bad. You are. You are. And I guess Noah just... Uh, See, I got a lot of sympathy for him, but now it's time to flip the script because something happens that should have never happened. And do you know what that was? His son, Ham, crossed the boundary in the same way that Eve crossed the boundary when God said, don't eat that tree. His son, Ham, should have never went into the tent. Did you hear me? He should have never went in. All right. Can I make an argument for it? Ham, you the baby. At least you're called the younger. I'm not going to get into that. Shem was the oldest. Japheth was the second oldest. Ham is supposed to be 30. But there may be an argument as to whether it was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I don't care. What I know is that Ham, you knock on your mom and daddy door before you go in the bedroom. Can I get some help right here? Knock on the door. I don't understand these parents that just let the kid come in whenever they want to come in. Knock on the door. Stay with me and knock and knock and knock until you get an answer. You don't get an answer, go away. Go away. That's what that means. Mom and daddy not going to buy a sign that says do not disturb. When we shut the door, that means you don't have a right to come in. And if you hear some noise, hurry up and run away. Right? Right? Hurry up and run away. See, I'm telling you, four men had the whole world. Ham, you could live 
thousands of miles away from daddy. Right? Why does Abraham have to worry about anybody showing up with that much territory? In his mind, he's thinking, well, his three boys younger than him. They're supposed to be doing what I'm doing. Way over on the other side of the world, having a bunch of sex to have a bunch of babies. Ain't nobody supposed to be showing up at my tent. Do you guys see the, the narrative? And yeah, here come Ham. Hmm. Meandering up to daddy's tent. I already know he got issues. I know he's got emotional issues. Don't he? He got emotional. He got to be close to mom and daddy. You know, we have something like that, right? They would still sleep in the same bed with us if they could. 30, 40, 50 years old. Come on now. Come on. Come on. And some mamas will let them. Some mamas will let them. Some mamas will let them. I can tell you that now. Some mamas will let them. Because mama got more going on with the boy than she does with her husband. On an emotional level. I'm just telling you the truth. See, what we're dealing with with the narrative is human beings. And you can extract from them normalcy if you want to, but you'll never get a right interpretation where you don't do that. Ham got issues. Okay? He come running up on his daddy tent. And according to subpoint C, the enemy took occasion. Look with me at verse 22. I just want you to capture this. I can tell I got your attention now so I can move forward. I'm going to teach you guys something today. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Do you see it? And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. The only way he could see it was to go into the tent. Which means he broke boundary initially. Now, it wouldn't have even been a problem then had he opened the jingle whoop, whoop, and then just pulled on back out. Whoop, 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 pull on back out. But remember, the first group of students that's being taught this text is not you and me, it's the Jews. Are y'all ready? Can you are you ready to be taught? So as soon as the narrative says that. Ham saw his father's nakedness. Moses now can teach national Israel what they are not to be doing when they enter into the promised land because the promised land are full of people who are like Ham and his son Canaan, which Canaan is the land that they're going to. Are y'all with me? Are y'all with me? Are y'all learning something? So, so Moses is teaching the children of Israel this is where it started. It started with one seed controlled by a demon, that is the devil, that does not recognize boundaries, does not recognize protocol, does not recognize hierarchy, does not recognize decency, morals, and ethics, does not recognize that you don't allow your eyes to see anything or hear anything that's going to lead your heart into sin. That's the world you and I live in. We live in a Hamite world, a Canaanite world. Is that right? That's the world we live in. So when Ham goes in, he should have turned around directly, but he does not. And immediately, watch this now, he that doeth righteousness is of God. He that does not do righteousness is not of God. He was exposed. This is amazing. Because what he did will be talked about in Tad in verse 27. But what we know he did explicitly was in looking upon his father's nakedness, and he saw the nakedness of his father, he immediately began to sell pornographic images of his father and his mother to his brother Shem and Japheth. Do you hear me? Because what he saw, he now conveys. And that's what the internet is about. That's what Facebook is about you too and all the images of naked people and illicit relationships that you and I see. What we see is simply somebody else telling us what other people are doing. Ham was your first porn seller. You got it? First seller of porn. First seller of porn. And what's wretched about it is this. You don't think your words matter, but they do. So a person that's struggling with their sexual identity or their identity period or sexual issues period, if they hear you paint a picture, they're already struggling. 
And here Ham tells his brothers that, hey, I saw daddy. And this is the way I saw daddy. You guys got that? Now, according to the Bible, he that repeated the matter of another is evil. That's according to the Bible. When you hear or see something of something that is really confidential and you go tell somebody else, that's evil. You guys understand that? Let me see if I can establish that principle for you. I'm going to uh, demonstrate it more uh, later on down the line. But in the book of Proverbs, chapter 29, verse, uh, verse, chapter 25, verse 9, this is what it says, Proverbs 25, verse 9. And mark this as a principle because here is where we have the beginning of pornography. It's rooted in gossip. Debate your cause with your neighbor himself and do not discover a what? Secret to another. Do you see it? Debate your cause with your neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. What that text tells you not to do is go around and telling other people's business. And that little word secret there meaning things that should not be known about other people that you have become aware of. Did not Ham become aware of his daddy's secret? Did he become aware of it? And he turns right around and violates Proverbs 25, 9, didn't he? And he goes and tells Shem and he goes and tells Japheth. Now, why we know that this is absolutely abominable, what he did, is because of the way that his brothers responded, which is going to teach us the gospel today. Remember the point? He that doeth righteousness is of God. He that doeth not righteousness is not of God. This is how you get to test yourself when you watch the porn on TV. When you get to watch the images on TV, do you have the spirit of holiness, the spirit of righteousness that causes you and graces you to avert it? Or do you simply let them tell you the story? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because that's what they want to do. They are intentionally wanting to sell you and tell you the story to corrupt your heart and corrupt your mind. Am I making some sense? That's exactly what they want to do, and that's what exactly happens to people every day. And may I say this, if you are absorbing that kind of diet every day, I don't care if it's regular TV or not, it's all bad. Soft porn is just as bad as hard porn. Asses out are just as bad as titties and asses out. Can I bring it home? Just as bad. Just as bad. Just as bad. But we get so used to it, don't we? We get so jaded by it, don't we? We get, it's like, it doesn't affect me. You've been already affected. It doesn't affect, you're already affected. Can I tell you why? You can't turn away. You're already affected. You're already corrupted. You're already jacked up. You forgot that the spirit that dwelleth in us is a spirit of jealousy. His job is to have you for himself in the context of holiness. We're about to go there because I'm going to lay out seven principles by which what Shem and Japheth did teach you and I the distinction between men and women of grace and people corrupted by this world system. Can I do it? Right. And so it's important for us to get it. Going back to our second point so I can wrap this up. Um, he stumbled in his liberty, that is Noah, and the enemy took occasion working through Ham. And this is what I call the fourth attack. The fourth attack takes place in Genesis 9, 22. And when he goes to tell Shem and Japheth what happens, this is the enemy attempting to redefine Noah. Can I teach you? Noah is a man of God. Noah is a child of grace. Noah is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Noah is justified freely by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Noah is a man for whom God loves and adores. Noah has every benefit and blessing of the person of work of Christ in his life. In God's eyes, Noah has never ever sinned. In God's eyes, Noah has perfectly obeyed all of God's law. In God's eyes, Noah is just as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. In God's eyes, Noah is clothed from head to toe. In God's eyes, Noah is not nakedness. Naked. 
In God's eyes, Noah is completely and adequately covered in the righteousness of Christ. But what does Ham say? No, Daddy Noah does not have Christ. Daddy Noah is without righteousness. Daddy Noah does not have the grace of God in Christ. Daddy Noah is not covered by the blood and righteousness of Christ. Daddy Noah is a sinner, an unredeemed sinner, an unregenerate sinner, a hell-bound sinner. He's a scandalous sinner because Daddy Noah is naked. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And that's slander. Is that slander or not? Are you with me? See, God is the God that what? And he covers us with what? The righteousness of Christ. Does God see Noah naked? Does God see Noah in a scandal? Does, he, does God see Noah as somehow uh, separated from Christ or separated from the Holy Ghost or separated from God? Not one mention by God of Noah. Not one mention by God of Noah being in the state that Ham has shown. All we know about what we have learned about Noah's nakedness came not from God, it came from Ham. I mean, all the way through your Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, God never exposes Noah's sin. I am glad I got a God like that. I am glad I got a God who not only knows how to cover my sin, but to put them away, to cast them behind his back, to put them in the sea of forgetfulness, and to define me, define me as the very son of God himself. This is heaven's decree about Noah. Am I making some sense? But Ham is trying to make his daddy out to be unprofitable, a flagrant sinner, a hell-bound sinner, a lost sinner. If y'all could see him the way I see him. See it? That's the enemy attacking daddy. And he goes and tells his two brothers because his two brothers are the only other people in the world. I do not want to divert here, but I could. Because as, as I was working through this text, I was going, Lord, why did you keep the women out of this one? And I'm going to tell you why. Can I tell you why? All right. So you will have a few people, if you guys know me, I'm fairly known all over the Bay Area and abroad. And a number of allegations have been raised against me as to not liking women, not loving women, not promoting women, not caring about women. I've had that charge leveled against me right along with every faithful gospel preaching man that I know for hundreds of years back, simply because we don't cross the boundary of scripture in terms of your roles and your offices. Are you hearing me? I hear it all the time. He doesn't like he doesn't like women. So funny. God gave me six daughters. <laughs> and he doesn't God have a sense of humor? And then he gave me four before he gave me a son. And I got six granddaughters. I got a bunch of women in my family. And I let them all come up here and tell their story about whether I love them or not and whether I would die for them in a moment that they might have Christ. Been telling them that forever. But I would never ever allow them to usurp authority over men in the position where God says they cannot be. Do you hear me? Now let me show you another truth. Let me show you another truth. Let me show you another truth. God is an even-handed God. That means God gets on both the men and the women. Back in Genesis 3, he had to tap on our sister. But in Genesis chapter 6, he had to tap on the brothers. Sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now he's getting ready to tap on a son. And so what God shows is, is that we are all together alike, whether men or women, sinners. Isn't that right? Either one of us, ladies and gentlemen, either one of us all by ourselves could keep hell on fire for all eternity. Just you 
or just me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You and I are no different in terms of being hell-bound sinners and are in need of the grace of God. But God does have a structure, doesn't he? God has an order. And either we're going to operate in obedience to God's order or we're going to be on the side of the devil. I just happen to have been given grace to actually stand on God's word and soundly teach it and boldly teach it. And I don't care what people think. I just really don't care. I, I really don't care. I mean, I grew up in the hood. I really don't care. If you want to start a fight, I, don't, I really don't mind. We can, we can throw down. That's just the way God made me, like the Apostle Paul. See, see, let God be true and every man a liar. Watch this now. I want to teach you something here. This is something I want to teach you. Three principles under point number three. And I think this is where I want to be. Yeah, three principles under point number three. The gospel of Christ established where? Shem and Japheth. This is quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. Because what we discover in verse 24 is this language. Watch this now. In verse 24. Uh, and I'm going to get back to verse 23 in a moment. And Noah awoke from his what? And he knew what his younger son had what? Whoa! Whoa! The way the Bible works is that it will allow you to understand deep and far-reaching implications without giving you explicit details. Because righteous people do not need to be told the whole story and every facet of the sordid detail for us to understand implication. Righteous people know. Righteous people know where there's smoke, there's what? That's exactly what we know. And when Noah said his son had done something to him, this is not for you and me. This is for national Israel. This is for Israel to know that the land into which they are going is the land for whom Noah cursed the son of Ham. The land of what? The land of what? And therefore, what Ham did in the tent, Noah comprehended on a prophetic level. What Ham did in the tent, Noah comprehended on a prophetic level. Let me see if I can make this clear real quick before we move on to the blessing of what his sons did. Drinking wine is a type of inebriation and apostasy where we depart from the sobriety of biblical truth and we end up falling asleep. Sleep is a type of apostasy and judgment in the world. God's people are called to be children of the day, not children of the night, that we are to walk in the light and not in the darkness, and we are not to be sleep like other people are asleep. But we do temporarily lapse. Have you ever gone to sleep? And hasn't God had to wake you up? Oh, thank you, God, for waking me up. I love this. I love this because, see, Noah has now awakened from his wine. Awaken from his sleep. Awaken from his stupor. Awaken from his darkness. Awake to righteousness and sin not. Christ makes it very plain. I think it's Ephesians chapter 5. He says, awake to righteousness. You who are asleep and Christ will give you light. Christ will give you light. It's as it were, Noah for a moment slipped and God raised him up again. And the moment God raised him up, he restored Noah to his position as a prophet. Do you hear me? He restored Noah to a position as a prophet. And immediately Noah knows what happens and he begins to prophesy. You guys got that? Now this here is also a warning to the church because the church as a whole can go to sleep in this inebriating Babylonian drunken system we live in. And if God is gracious, he can wake us up. He's not going to wake us up through a ham. He's going to wake us up through a shem and a japheth. And he's going to wake us up through a shim and a japheth because the shim and a japheth are going to show us how you respond to sin in the world according to the gospel. Are y'all hearing me? And now I'll come back briefly and talk about, just briefly and talk about the prophecy that Noah makes for which I give the third point. Under our third point then, sub point A, a satanic seed in the family line revealed. You see it? 
What do you mean, Pastor? Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done. And he says in verse 25, Cursed be who? A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Stop right there. Why is he cursing Canaan when Ham was the one in the tent? How do y'all ever ask that question? That's because you ain't never read that Bible, that Bible verse. Y'all don't read your Bible. So I, I can't actually build off of that question, but I'm going to say it like this for you to get it. The Bible very clearly says that God will often allow the sins of the parents to be passed on to the children to the third and fourth generation. As you have it in the Decalogue, the iniquity of the fathers being passed to the what? The iniquity of the fathers being passed to the children. Have you seen that? And why does God allow that? Because God actually sees the end from the beginning. It's not that God inserts sin or makes them sin. He simply declares what he sees. Stay with me. And what God knows, and this is what Noah declares, is that what is done in small measure by a father will be done in greater measure by a son. And then in even exponentially larger measure by a grandson. Am I making some sense? What David did went exponentially larger in Solomon. Did it not? Right. And you can find this same kind of like father, like son paradigm with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham lies. Isaac lies. Am I making sense? And so when God says the sins of the fathers being passed on to the children, it's not that God's making them sin. It's simply that he's affirming that if you and I start off with a sinful pattern, we have no reason to believe that our kids won't take it and run with it. And so that what Noah knows is that Ham actually gives grounds for the whole book of Leviticus, chapters 18 through 22 especially. When you read Leviticus 18 through 22, remember your feet are in the shoes of the children of Israel going through the wilderness, right? God tells Israel, do not look upon your father's nakedness. Do not look upon your mother's nakedness. Do not look, fathers, upon your daughter's nakedness. Do not look, sons, upon your father's nakedness. In other words, what he was telling Israel is that the Canaanites, all of these pagan nations in Canaan, would all be committing incest. They would all be committing homosexuality. They would all be committing lesbianism. They would all be committing pederasty. Do you know what pederasty is? Men sleeping with boys. They would all be committing bestiality. All that's in the prohibition of Leviticus 18 through 22. Is that right? And therefore what Ham does in the tent with his daddy is so dark and black that God would not tell us. As Paul put it in the book of Ephesians, it is a shame to even speak of those things that they do in the dark. You know what breaks my heart here, child of God? Our generation that we live in has no shame. Can I have five more minutes? And this is strategically a work of the devil. See, long ago when righteousness reigned over our nation, wicked men and wicked women had to do their wickedness in isolated places. You had to go to sordid areas to engage in the folly. You had to sneak out with your trench coat and big hat and black shades. Back before there were cameras everywhere and videos. Now they catch you going into the porn shop. You might as well wave because they got you now. Right? But back before cameras were ubiquitous everywhere, there was a realm of darkness people could walk in. And you could sneak in and go buy your videos and your toys and your paraphernalia, according to Romans chapter 1, evil inventions. And you can go and exercise the folly of what the prophets of the Old Testament warned about. Am I making some sense? But today we live with the lights on completely. In fact, the spotlight shines you all the way to the whorehouses, all the way to the red light districts, all the way to the x-ray. In fact, you don't even have to go anywhere. It's on your phone. It's on your screen. Am I making some sense? 
And because it, because of this open, blatant sort of policy of coming out, it's everywhere. And it's being everywhere impacts young people who don't have a rooting and grounding in God or a clear understanding on the Imago Day into which they were created, by which they were created, for which they were created. And now they struggle with their hormones, struggle with their emotions, struggle with their identity, struggle with their calling, because they don't know that at the core of their humanity is not their emotions, but their intellect and their intelligence. And the moral and ethical framework with which God gives them to be able to make right choices, to do good things, and enjoy the blessings of life. Am I making some sense? So God made our children with minds. And the mind is to rule the heart. The heart is not to rule the mind. The heart only operates right when these three components are working together. Are you ready? Intelligence. That is information, right data. Volition, that is dry volition. And then emotions, that's desire or passion. Desire must give way to volition, that is the will. And volition must give way to intellect, that is the mind. The mind informs the will, the will directs the passion. All three are designed to work together to do the right thing. Am I making some sense? You don't let... Your emotions simply dictate and override the logic of your mind. You don't let your emotions uh, dictate and, as it were, drive slavishly your will. At that point, you are a servant of sin. Am I making some sense? Am I making sense? All right. It's very important to know. Now, let me close it down this way. I'm going to shut it down this way. Going to, uh, going to now point number B. Sub point B on our, on our opening text. The love of Shem and Japheth expressed in verse 23. Is that a good way to put it? The love of Shem and Japheth expressed in verse 23. This is remarkable to me. I could take this up next week. I really could. But I'm going to lay these principles down to you because I want them in your ear. Remember what we said about God. God by nature is what? Love. God is love. And therefore, love what? Covers. Love what? Covers. Love what? Covers a multitude of sins. Right. When you expose somebody, you hate them. Ham hated his daddy. But Shem and Japheth loved their daddy. And this, what they did to show their love, is remarkable to me. The first thing they did was reject the counsel and the gossip and the slander of their brother Ham against their daddy Noah by walking backwards when they went into the tent. They said, we do not listen to you. We're not going to let this get in our head. We're not going to follow you. They're walking backwards said, no, we don't accept that idea. We don't see our daddy that way. He doesn't look like that to me. My daddy doesn't look like what you said he looked like. And for the believer, we walk backwards in this world just like that. We walk with our back to the world. Backwards, 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 backwards. Why do you have your back backwards? Because I don't want to see your nakedness. I don't want to see your sinfulness. I don't want to see your wretchedness. And I don't want you to see mine. God then made me a new creature in Christ. He told me to keep my eyes fixed on Christ. And I walk backwards because I'm headed to glory. You know what I love about what just happened? It's not just one brother walking backwards. It's two brothers. You know what that means? Point number two. They had a unity about what they did. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let, them, let the word of God be established. It was two brothers walking backwards. Two brothers walking backwards in agreement. And as they're walking backwards, they found a garment, a big old garment, a big old covering, the covering of God. The covering of grace. The covering of righteousness. So when the Bible says, He that covereth, he that turneth a man away from his sin has covered a multitude of transgressions. Are y'all seeing that? Let me show you five things in under those two. And I want you to get this because I want to close here. There are five things. You can write these down too. The first one is the backwards walk of the believer in a sinful world. 
the backwards walk of a believer in a sinful world. You'll find that to work. You'll find that to work. The backwards walk of a believer in a sinful world. See, the world's going one way, we're going another way. You look crazy when you say no. Do you hear me? The backwards walk of a believer in a sinful world. Are y'all following me? Point number one. Point number two. Here it is. Point number two. The unity of purpose between two. God sent them out two by two. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. The unity of purpose in the mouth of two. Remember, woe unto you when you are alone. Because when you fall, there's not another to pick you up. Ham fell because he was all alone. Wasn't nothing to pick up there. But Shem and Japheth demonstrated that they were of one mind and of one will and of one mouth. The unity of purpose. Secondly, can I show you another truth? The humility of their practice. The humility of their practice. This is Galatians chapter 6, 1 and 2. Pull it up. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Paul said that we are to bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ, right? If you find a brother in a fault, are you ready? You who are what? You who are what? Stay with me. Let me help you with that right quick. You who are humble. You who have the humility of grace, having been taught correctly by the gospel, that you are not any better than the person who has fallen. See, when, I, when it says spiritual, it's not talking about eggheads full of doctrinal knowledge. It's talking about mature men and women who know, uh-uh. If I'm going to go after this assignment, i got to go backwards. I'm walking humbly, lest I also be tempted the same way. So you had two humble, mature, spiritual brothers who walked backwards as they dealt with their father's shame, making sure they were not contaminated by what they saw. Are y'all with me? And so they're walking backwards and they're walking in unity and they're walking in humility. It's very clear. If a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore, restore. See our word restore? Cover. Cover. Mend. Fix. This is what we learned last night. Did we not mend? To cover is to mend and fix. Are they mending what their dad did? Are they covering? Are they restoring him? Let me show you what I mean by that. Point number three then. Honor of the patriarch. Honor of the patriarch. Not only are they walking in a backwards way in order to refute the world system, reproving darkness. Not only are they walking in the unity of purpose. And not only are they walking in the humility of practice. They're walking in the honor of the patriarch. They are honoring their father. It's not our teaching this year, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Right. Well, how can you honor somebody when you're exposing their nakedness? Are y'all getting that? Are y'all getting that? And doesn't the Bible say honor your mother and your father? So don't you take that garment of righteousness and garment of mercy and go backwards and make sure you cover them? Lest more damage be brought on them? Are y'all with me? Can I give you another one? The other one is holiness of their person. Second Corinthians 7, 1, pull it up. So not only do we have them walking backwards in a wicked world, refuting and rejecting the bad counsel of this world system, not only do we have them walking in unity of purpose, humility of practice, and honor of the patriarch, but of holiness of person. What do you mean? I don't want to find myself soiled, are contaminated, are corrupted, because I become used to the world. Y'all see Second Corinthians seven? Is it up there? Have y'all? How many of y'all ever read that verse before? I'm gonna let y'all out of here in a moment. Ten people. Here it is. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us what? Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness. Were they operating in holiness? Were they showing that they were not going to be corrupted? They weren't going to watch that porn show. They weren't going to see what their brother was talking about. I need to just see exactly what he talked No, you don't. You don't need to see it. It's bad enough you heard it. Right? Walking backwards because 
they have a holiness of persons in view. Three more. Healing of the prophet. Their aim was to heal. Not only was their aim to refute this world system, walk in unity of purpose, humility of practice, honor of the patriarch, holiness of their person, which I would say in my present world, I see very little of that with the believer. I see very little of that in the life of the believer. Holiness of persons. But healing of the prophet. What do you mean, Pastor? I just quoted it. Pull it up. James 520. The only reason that Noah rises up is because of the healing objective of his two boys. Noah could not have risen up. Noah could not have risen up. Noah could not have gotten up if he woke up naked and discovered that Ham had told Shem and Japheth, and now it's everywhere in the world. My daddy is naked. My daddy is unclothed. My daddy is unrighteous. My daddy is wicked. He never could have prophesied again. God restored Noah by the act of his son Shem and Japheth. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from what? And shall hide a multitude of sins. The only way you and I recover from our sin is by that act. God does that in our life every day. Every day God recovers us from sin. Every day God covers us. Every day God restores us. Every day we find ourselves recovering from the stupidity of our sinful actions. And this is how the body of Christ should be working with one another. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Healing of the prophet is what they're doing because they knew their daddy was the last millennial in the world. The most important man in the world, and we're not going to let him be taken down by the gossip of a silly, foolish brother. Am I making some sense? I got one or two more to go here, and then we'll close. Very important point. So not only is it the healing of the prophet for which he rises up, but point number six, I want you to get this, and this is called help necessary for true recovery. Please write it down, help necessary for true recovery. This is James 5, 16. This is where we're in our GOG. By the way, we're having an outstanding GOG class this Saturday. Every sister in the church should be there. Everybody watching should be there. If you can make it, show up this Saturday, okay? I think it's this Saturday. Is it this Saturday? This DOG Saturday, you want, it's a, it's a, we're our final one for the year. We're closing out in a Christmas celebration, but I'll be your teacher this year. And I want to talk to you about grace. I want to talk to you about how we receive grace and how we reflect on grace in order that the grace may impact our life. You want to be there. We want you to be there. We hope that you will be there. It's going to be a great time, great time, great time. I'm looking forward to us preparing for the new year because I want to do better in the new year than I did this year. I want to do better in the year 2019 than I did this year. I want my sisters to do better. I want us to be much more opportunistic. I want us to be much more Christ-centered, focused. I want grace to work much more effectually in our life. That's what we're going to talk about. How grace is received, how grace works, and how you reflect upon grace in order that it make an impact. It's going to be a good time. Be a good time. Here's the point that I'm about to make. Help necessary for true what? Recovery. James 5, 16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be what? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of veil of mud. Was Shem and Japheth praying for their daddy while they were covering him? Were they praying for him? They better have been praying for him. You can't do a work for God by which it actually brings about grace where you don't pray. You don't love people if you don't pray for them. Am I making some sense? And, 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 and so watch this. I want to teach you a truth. Here's the truth. Actual healing comes from covering or forgiveness when it's a subject-object relationship. I want you to get this. Actual healing, which is the outcome of forgiveness, which is what it means to cover, is rooted in an act of love that is a subject object relationship you do not cover yourself I'm done right here but I'm gonna drive it home when you sin you need another to cover you when you sin you need another to cover you 
If you cover yourself, you're no different than Adam and Eve with the fig leaves. And that's why daddy came along and stripped them off. Because you and I are not qualified to cover ourselves. Because the covering has to come at the cost of another. Are you hearing me? The covering has to come at the cost of another. If you cover yourself, it amounts to you believing that you have the payment for your sin. If you cover yourself, it amounts to you saying that your sin is not so bad that you have to confess it. All I got to do is cover myself. But you know what Proverbs 28, 13 says? Proverbs 28, 13, part A, makes it clear. Whosoever covereth his sins shall not prosper. Is that what it says? Do y'all see it up there? Whosoever covereth his own sin shall not what? And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. Proper and appropriate healing from sinful actions has to be a subject-object relationship. Well, I'm going to go to God to have him cover me. That's what I want you to do. You go to God. You ask God to cover you, but I'm going to tell you what God's going to tell you. Are you ready? One thing. Here's what he's going to tell you. Unless you have confessed your sin, I will not and am not obligated to cover your sin. See, Adam and Eve learned how to do what? Confess. Unless you confess your sin. Because, see, God doesn't want you walking around thinking you can rip him off in your relationship with him by sinning that grace may abound. See it? And the other principle I just want you to get is this. When we recognize the subject-object relationship of someone else covering you, it means you are humble enough to acknowledge you need help. Daddy Noah needed help. Did he not? He needed help. And sometimes you need help. And sometimes I need help. And this is why when we have a family of God, a people of God, a brotherhood, people that we can trust, we can go to and say, you know what, man? I'm naked. I'm naked right now. Between you and me, I'm in trouble, man. I need you. I need you to talk to me. I need you to encourage me. I need you to pray for me. I need you to go to the throne of God for me. Because my heart is not right. I'm not right with God. I need the prayers of the saints in order for God to have mercy on me. See, now when you can't do that, you're too proud. Too proud. Do you hear? Do you hear? So what we see in our text is that love operating by faith results in covering, which results in healing, which allowed Noah to rise up and shoot an arrow of prophecy through the heart of Ham and Canaan and landed in the land of Canaan where God took his only begotten son, the true seed, and planted him in Canaan. And that seed in Canaan blew Canaan wide open. The seed of God's son busted Canaan wide open, the very cursed Canaan, the very perverse Canaan, the very wicked Canaan, the very vile Canaan is now penetrated by the seed of God. And the seed of God now is able to bring sinners from all over Canaan into Christ. Sinners from the Hamites, sinners from the Japhethites, sinners from the Canaanites, all are recovered from their sinful condition through that seed that was planted in Canaan. This is what he meant when he says, and blessed be the God of Shem and Japheth. Shem are the Semitic people. They are the Hebrews from whom Abraham comes, from whom David comes, from whom Christ comes. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Y'all know it. We didn't talk this a long time ago, right? We didn't talk this a long time ago. Caveat done. Y'all, 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 y'all have done well today. Watch this now. Noah's cursing Canaan was not a curse on black people. Write it down. The most stupid argument and conclusion on planet Earth. Chapter 10, verse 6, plainly tells us Ham had four sons. One of them was Canaan. The other three boys were not cursed. They was all black. Libyans, Egyptians, Ethiopians, I'm, I'm here to tell you how it works. And God blessed all those nations. 
The one nation that he cursed temporarily was Canaan. But he fixed that curse by sending his son through the nation of Israel into the land of Canaan, turning it from a cursed nation into the land flowing with milk and honey. And it's a picture of you and I being cursed under the law of God. But blessed be he who hung upon that tree. Blessed be he who hung upon that tree. Cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. But Christ bore our curse that we might be liberated from the curse of the law and be made the righteousness of God in him. Y'all with me? This is how we understand the gospel in the Bible. Amen. Amen. All right.